And if everybody will come back in the room, we're going to start. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So just to show you how things are happening in real time, while that panel was going on, um, the law school was able to do an announcement that has just hit the press that we're very excited to share with you, and that is that we just got a $3 million contribution to endow our law technology in the Arts Center. Um, so great things are happening at the law school, both here at the conference and out there. And to kick off our, our next panel, we have Don Howard, who is a professor and fellow at the Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values at University of Notre Dame. And the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Michael. And thanks to Shannon and Avi and uh, Nancy and everybody who has done a wonderful job in organizing uh, today's event. The logistics have been fantastic. Uh, so we're now turning to our second panel of the day on cyber uh, warfare. And nothing could be more timely than this topic. Uh, one reason being that just earlier this week, on Monday, it was announced in the New York Times that during uh, Obama's visit to Estonia, which has been taking place the last day or so, uh, NATO would formally announce and ratify uh, a new policy on collective defense against uh, cyber attack. This is something that's especially uh, uh, of interest to Estonia, it having been in 2007 uh, the first uh, publicly acknowledged example, it having been the target of the first publicly accepted example of a really massive cyber attack uh, emanating, we think, in that case uh, from uh, uh, Russia. With Estonia now a member of NATO, the declaration of collective defense against cyber attack in future uh, is really a very, very uh, important step. To help us think about all the issues that are on the table here, we have three uh, very interesting and very distinguished uh, speakers today. Let me introduce them uh, uh, very briefly so as to save as much time as possible for their own opening statements and our ensuing uh, discussion. Uh, first up uh, in our uh, uh, discussion today will be Colonel Matteo uh, Martimucci, or better known as Mooch uh, to his friends, uh, who uh, is uh, uh, a really interesting person partly because He's got inside knowledge of what goes on in U.S. cyber operations. Uh, Mooch is currently the commander of the 318th Cyberspace Operations Group, 688th Cyberspace Wing uh, in San Antonio at Lackland um, uh, Air Force Base in uh, Texas. Um, he has long experience on the command side in uh, uh, cyber operations. Um, and beyond that, a long and distinguished career in the United States uh, Air Force. Second up today uh, is Molly Souter, who comes to us as a PhD student in communication studies at McGill and currently a Berkman Center Fellow uh, at Harvard uh, University. Uh, she has a forthcoming book that is directly on, tar uh, on point for what we're talking about today uh, to be published uh, next month by Bloomsbury Academic. Uh, the book is entitled The Coming Swarm, DDOS Actions, Directed Denial of Service Actions, Hacktivism, and Civil Disobedience uh, on the Internet. And our third speaker is probably uh, well known to many people in the room already, uh, and we're grateful to have him with us here today. And that is uh, Peter Singer, who's one of the best known uh, public uh, uh, commentators on many of the issues that are on the agenda today. Uh, his previous book, Wired for War, uh, has really helped to set the agenda for a lot of current discussion about autonomous systems, drones, and the uh, like. And his uh, latest book, uh, Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Needs to Know, which he co-authored with Alan Friedman, uh, goes a long way toward doing the same for shaping this discussion space that we are in today 
around uh, cyber uh, warfare. Uh, with those introductions, I am going to myself retire to a seat at the end of the table. I don't have Shannon's stamina for standing for an hour and a half and moderating a panel discussion. Uh, and I will invite our panelists to begin with their uh, prepared five minute remarks. And we will go in the order of the introduction, uh, Mooch, Molly, and Peter. So, Mooch, please. All right, great. Thank you, Don. Uh, I've never been able to say anything in less than five minutes, so we're going to see if we can make this happen. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to just offer five kind of big points, uh, hopefully really to tease out um, the, the Q&A. But I'll begin with really what I think to be three sort of cyberspace truths that really inform everything from the, the grand strategic down to the, the tactical and operational levels. Uh, and the first is that in cyberspace, the advantage does go to the attacker. Uh, it's an often used and perhaps trite statement, but, but it is uh, something that really informs how the Department of Defense deals with uh, the defense of our networks, um, uh, and really everyone does. Uh, and, and that is, it's harder to defend than it is to attack or exploit. Uh, it's not impossible, but it is difficult. Uh, and because of that, it has the potential to change the balance of military power. Uh, in the traditional uh, military technological advantage that we uh, and many Western states have enjoyed, uh, I would offer, have been <coughs> eroded and will continue to be eroded to a degree uh, by the opportunities afforded uh, non-state actors or less than peer competitors uh, in the cyberspace domain. Now, that's not to say that powerful states can't leverage uh, the advantage enjoyed by the US and the West, uh, but I suggest that we ought to continue to try to do that uh, but we need to recognize uh, that the, the balance may, in fact, have changed at least a degree. Uh, the third point here is that the further advantage uh, in offensive cyberspace operations is gained by those who are not constrained by the laws, the mores, and the rules. Uh, we saw this happen, uh, really similar parallels to terrorism or insurgency activities, right? There was a, an entity that ostensibly follows a set of rules and then an actor who chooses to either change the rules or not follow that existing set of rules. And that's in fact happening uh, in the cyberspace domain. Uh, I would really just say here that, uh, and I think it's been said already today, uh, the US has not matured its tactical rules of engagement nor its operational strategic uh, laws of war to allow for that effective defense or in fact offensive operations in cyberspace. Right for discussion and debate. So the second big point is that there's a difference between computer network attack and computer network exploitation. I'm a bit of a, uh, I proselytize about the, the looseness of the language in this domain, right? But we read a lot in the newspapers and press and media about all of the cyber attacks that are happening. I would offer that most of those things that you hear about as attacks are in fact exploits or computer network exploitation. If you are conducting one of the, what we consider the five Ds, deny, degrade, disrupt, destroy, or deceive, then you are in fact conducting an attack. If you are simply exfiltrating data, stealing data, or really stealing copies of data, then you are conducting computer network exploitation. Now the interesting thing is, as a declaratory policy, the US does not conduct economic espionage where, in terms of computer network exploitation for economic gain. Uh, whereas other countries, mainly China and others, do not make that distinction. And that's important to understand um, because they do, other countries, regularly target our economic infrastructure, private industrial sectors for economic and national security gain. And that brings me to my third point, which is the greatest threat to our national security via cyberspace is not a doomsday attack or some major attack that will turn the lights off on the East Coast. While many people have written about it, it is the most scary thing I would offer. It is not the most realistic thing. In the long term, the large scale, long term threat against our intellectual property, the theft of IP and our capital is what I consider to be the greatest national security threat in the domain of cyberspace and one that we ought to focus on. So given that point, there will come a day, I believe, that the US government and perhaps the Department of Defense will be asked to defend in cyberspace those things which we currently do not. The challenge is in order to provide for that defense, the DOD would have to operate in that public IP space, which we currently do not. So that is an area I'm sure that we will uh, we'll discuss, and it's an area I call the expectation gap, right? So in the future, the Department of Defense is supposed to defend. But unlike 
flying in airspace after 9-11, no one questioned that F-16s were flying over downtown D.C. Uh, people certainly would question the Department of Defense operating in what we consider public IP, IP space today. So my final point, we have about 45 seconds left, uh, and I think this one is already well understood, is that policy and law, both U.S. and international, including the law of armed conflict, has not caught up to cyber warfare capability development. Now, there's great concern over the oversight of cyber weapons today, and perhaps in the Q&A I can offer some examples of how the decisions that traditionally today in the kinetic world are left to junior officers at the tactical levels are in fact being decided at the National Security Council Deputies Committee level today because we simply don't understand uh, the, the nature of the uh, cyberspace capabilities today. So with that time uh, being up, I will, I will uh, end right there. <laughs> Right, hi, uh, my name is Molly Sauter. Uh, just before I get started, can I get a show of hands of people who are familiar with George Lakoff's metaphor analysis, his work on metaphor analysis? Okay, we'll start at the beginning. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be talking about some assumptions that are, and ideological assumptions that are underlaying current cyber war policy and cyber war thinking at the government level. Um, primarily what something I'm calling the geospatial operational metaphor of the internet. What the geospatial operational metaphor says is that the internet can be read as a map, as a map that looks like a map that you see hanging up on a classroom wall. When we look at the internet, it exists as something that can be easily divided up into countries, and easily divided up into geographic and jurisdictional areas. And my current argument is that, well, that's not actually accurate. What it is is a very useful metaphor that can be used to help people understand the internet, understand how the internet works, but is in fact it leads to a number of faulty assumptions and a number of faulty implementations that can have massive problems, especially when it comes to human rights on the internet and freedom of speech on the internet and other related issues. So what is an organizational metaphor? An organizational metaphor is what it sounds like. It's a metaphor you use to help you deal with concepts that you're not familiar with or to help you sort of define a discourse around a complicated subject. The problem with these powerful metaphors is that they can actually restrict the discourse that occurs. So one easy way to think about this is an argument is a war. People are sort of intuitively familiar with that. You fight with people, you attack someone's point, you defend your own point. But what this leads to is people being trapped within a confrontational mode of operation in an argument. If we had a different operational and conceptual metaphor for arguments, like arguments are a dance, we may approach interpersonal conflict differently. But if you like, take a couple seconds right now and try to think of how you would express an argument as a dance, you're probably gonna find that's actually very difficult. It's because the previous highly combative argument is a war metaphor is actually just dominating your mental discourse and how you think of this topic. So the organizational metaphor for the geospatial internet is massively present in how we define the internet both governmentally and in terms of policy. And some of the things that this, that this metaphor sort of manifest is in cyber war policy is it assumes that the internet is easily and intuitively divided according to the geo geopolitical and geographic divisions of the quote unquote <coughs> real world. It encourages interactions with infrastructure, protocols, and the content of the internet as if it were constructed from and bounded by existing states. So we see this in different battles about content in Europe and in the states where we have issues like Nazi-related content in France and the Yahoo decision or the right to be forgotten in the recent EU case. Um, so why is this a problem? Why is it a problem to think about the internet as the world as we geographically understand it? Well, this metaphor favors shifting existing policy frameworks and structures of power wholesale from the physical world into the online space without really questioning those assumptions. It grossly simplifies quote unquote code actions and the problem of online jurisdiction, which is something we can talk about for hours. Um, it encourages the transfer of existing states of conflict and interstate aggression to the online space. Rather than rethinking what we want the online space to function as, we're simply seamlessly translating it into another zone of aggression. And I have to turn this page. 
Another major point is that taken within the context of the harmonization of international anti-terror treaties and especially international IP treaties, this metaphor exacerbates the conflation of actual and physical harm with economic and corporate harm to the detriment of individual rights and freedoms. And I think we're probably going to talk about that in terms of what we should be defending, whether it's <laughs> corporate IP content as well as our physical borders or whether we should be drawing a distinction there. So because of the huge amount of US-based corporations that are massively, overwhelmingly in control of practical internet governance, this metaphor also favors the hegemony of US-based laws and regulations in terms of governance of the online space. And it encourages a fractured development of infrastructure wherein countries are primarily concerned with policing their own online borders rather than encouraging the seamless spread of innovation and technology interoperability across national lines. And I'm just going to stop there, because otherwise I could go on forever. <laughs> so. Thanks, Molly. Peter. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Set Mons and the law school and the various centers, and also the um, Wolf Foundation for bringing us together on this really interesting and exciting and important series of topics. Uh, for the panel on um, cyber arms control, I thought it'd be interesting to wrestle with um, what are added challenges beyond the way we've so far typically talked about arms control and um, cyberspace? So for example, uh, is what is and isn't um, an attack according, this was part of the Talon Manual question, or the issues of attribution? Um, and I would argue that there's three additional uh, forces issues that we're going to have to wrestle with when it comes to cyber arms control that we have to pay attention to. And the first of these is, um, it's not nice to say, but it's real, ignorance. Um, President Obama uh, declared that cybersecurity risks pose, quote, the most serious economic national security challenge of the 21st century, which we'd agree with that. But there's an interesting second quote that motivated me in, in writing that um, book that was mentioned, and it's from a former CIA director who said, quote, rarely has something been so important and so talked about with less and less clarity and less apparent understanding. And you can see that in all sorts of different ways, whether it's statistical, 70% um, of business executives have made a cybersecurity decision for their company, despite the fact that no major MBA program teaches it as part of your normal management responsibilities. That's the same thing at the schools we teach our lawyers, our journalists, our diplomats, um, we're just now working it into professional military education. Um, or you can come at that through anecdotes. Uh, for example, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, which is ostensibly in charge of the civilian side of cybersecurity in the US, um, and also linking to this issue of DDoSs, um, in a recent New Yorker article described uh, the hacktivist group Anonymous as Exhibit A of cyber threats, which you know, I think we can talk about why that's completely erroneous. But the bottom line is um, she had a wonderful quote she said last year, um, don't laugh, but I just don't use email at all, end quote. <laughs> it wasn't a fear of security or privacy concerns. It was because she didn't believe email was useful. Um, or another example, a top US official who was going off to negotiate with the Chinese on cybersecurity questions asked me what an ISP was. That's like going off to negotiate with the Soviets in the Cold War and not knowing what an ICBM when it comes to just basic acronyms. So the result is that cybersecurity is one of these areas that you know, matters whether on a personal level, your security of your bank account, to geopolitical and ethical questions, but it's treated as largely a domain for the it crowd. The um, technical folks get the workings of the software and the hardware, they don't deal well with the wetware, with the human side. And in turn, the people who work on the ethics and the law and the policy don't deal well with the technical side. And so it's a space where myth and reality and hype weave together. And that example of um, the cyber Pearl Harbor phenomena or cyber terrorism, um, there have been 31,000 academic journal and major magazine articles on cyber terrorism. There have been zero actual incidents of it. Um, so bottom line, if we're not going to be able to do anything effective in it until we kind of demystify this realm. Second, there's a series of assumptions in this field that um, go unchallenged, but they challenge arms control. One that we just heard about was um, offense has the advantage. 
Um, that's baked into all our thinking, um, whether it's in ethical discussions to what we spend on. Um, the U.S. military spends roughly 2.5 times more on offensive cyber research and development than it does on defensive cyber research and development. So that's what we want. The problem with this is, um, first, the reality is cyber offense is not as easy as it's too often portrayed. There's a difference between the ease of a DDoS and pulling off a Stuxnet. And yet we talk about them as it's just you need you know, some teenagers with Red Bull for either. The second is um, history shows that these assumptions of offense being permanently dominant, um, we get wake up calls. Prior to World War I is a great example where everybody assumed all the weapons would mean offense would dominate and World War I didn't turn out that way. Third, it's bad strategic thinking. It only um, works in a binary environment, not when you're in an environment of multiple actors out there. You can't deter your way out of it just by investing in offense. But fourth and most important to the question is I think it limits us when it comes to arms control because if you believe that um, attack is the only way to protect yourself, then any idea of limiting attack capabilities will be viewed as anathema. Arms control will be viewed as the way to security. Arms control will be viewed as the way to um, make yourself insecure. Um, this leads to the third, I'm gonna abuse my time, but the third and, and final structural flaws when it comes to cybersecurity and um, arms control. Um, the internet has allowed us to share information effectively on everything except the security of the internet itself. <laughs> Private companies, don't like to talk to each other or to the government about threats and responses to them. Governments don't like to share in this space. Um, the result is, uh, as Kevin Mandia, a cybersecurity expert puts it, no one is getting smarter. Arms control depends on transparency, and yet this is a space where we don't like to be transparent for a variety of reasons. That leads to um, a second structural thing, which is um, because it's not a classic physical domain and metaphors, um, you can't count weapons. You can't, uh, like you would with a, a nuclear weapons treaty. You can't put lines, physical lines, like um, the Antarctic treaty says you can't take weapons past this line. There's not clear red lines when it comes to cyber. It also means that time is working against you. Attacks in cyber, because they're not physical, can take place in nanoseconds, but they can play out over years. Also, your response to an attack is contrary to typical um, arms control thought. Your best response to a cyber attack may be to not raise your hands and say, how dare you violate, you attack me. It may be to keep quiet about it, study the attack, close the vulnerability, and um, act like it didn't work. And this leads to the final structural flaw, the one that's really ugly to talk about in ethical situations, which is incentives are misaligned, or another way of putting it, money is working against us. This is a space where um, we've combined threat prediction and analysis with operations. So in the military, it's like combining the person in charge of the CIA with the person in charge of Pacific Command. So the person that's arguing for the size and scale of the threat is the same one arguing for the budget to deal with it. That also is on the private sector side where the people that are telling you about the threat are the ones who are equally saying, oh, and by the way, you can pay me money for this scary boogeyman threat to go away. It even gets more complex when we talk about people moving over from the military side to the civilian side where they've just recently been telling private industry about threats to them and now coming in on the business side and saying, pay me a million dollars a month to make this scary thing go away. So um, this back to metaphors means that at the end of the day, maybe arms control isn't even the best metaphor for this space. It may be um, other metaphors to think about marketplaces, public health, et cetera. Thanks. Thank, uh, thanks to all of you. I want to take a few minutes to allow the panelists to interact among themselves around some of the um, uh, issues that have already emerged here as uh, key to what I think our discussion is meant to focus on, such as things like the comparative uh, importance of offense versus defense uh, in cyber conflict. But let me also seed this discussion with one other question that has been uh, ever so slightly touched upon so far. 
this is a law school. We're interested in international law perspectives on cyber uh, warfare. Uh, I myself would be very much interested in hearing from all three panelists about uh, what you think is the current state of international law as it bears upon cyber warfare, and what are the challenges and the prospects for doing more and better to norm, uh, well, to use the spatial metaphor, the, the international space of uh, cyber uh, conflict. Uh, Mooch, would you like to? Sure. Um, I guess I'll take them in the order uh, you asked. The, the first, um, uh, to Peter's point about arms control, I, it's a, this is a difficult debate because I think you've, you've got to link arms control to deterrence. Uh, and then the really difficult question is, in the cyberspace domain, <coughs> considering the actors in it, deterrence against whom? Wh whom are we, who is it that we're really deterring, right? Uh, we, and this really kind of almost gets to the second question that you asked. I believe we continue to apply this traditional Westphalian nation state structure to what really does it always apply in the cyberspace domain, right? So um, with respect to arms control, um, if, if everybody's got equal arms and you assume that, excuse me, uh, governments are the ones that, with whom you're acting, um, there may be utility. But when the threat is posed, again, from a computer network exploitation standpoint, by, for example, the Russian business network, which is a criminal enterprise looking to make uh, disgusting amounts of money, and they do so, their incentive is to not break the thing that they're stealing from, but get right to the threshold of pain, right? So they're operating, how do you deter them that? And is, that a, is there a role for a government, or do we just let private industry deal with that right now, as they currently are, right? They're simply accepting that pain, and it hasn't reached a threshold of pain for Bank of America, or Chase, or Wall Street, or anyone to say, okay, no mas, I need help, can't, this, we're losing too much. Uh, so deterrence against whom uh, is the question. Uh, in the case of the <coughs> espionage that I spoke about, for the first time we actually have clear attribution. Our United States government in a Department of Justice indictment actually named five Chinese People Liberation Army actors, attributed them to the Chinese government and said, you are doing this. But they have done nothing beyond that. So currently, we impose no cost, whether it's against a criminal enterprise like the Russian Business Network, against a nation state who is stealing secrets, like China. We've imposed no cost, so they continue to act with impunity. So there is no deterrence. So it, this is a great first step. For example, the attribution saying, yes, China has done it. But it begs the question now, now what? Uh, is there going to be a cyberspace Monroe Doctrine? Is there a line drawn in the sand that says, okay, if you do this, there will be repercussions? That, to me, is the essence of deterrence, some sort of declaratory policy coupled with uh, a capability and an intent to act. Uh, neither of those, or actually none of those, currently exist today. So I'm very interested in the, in the arms control metaphor because one thing that is currently happening, and it's happening a lot on sort of the criminal side and also in the cyber war side, is a there's a fuzziness about what is a weapon or what is weaponized code. And what this leads to is it leads to a unreasonable amount of exploitation by police, by law enforcement, and by the defense sector in declaring certain code off limits to civilians, saying this code is weaponized code, this is a weapon, if you use it, you're a cyber terrorist, or you're committing an act of cyber terror, or you're an otherwise enemy combatant or bad actor. And what seriously worries me there is this fencing off of actions that you can take, and by and saying if you take this action in this information space, you are a terrorist. So one example that I know a lot about um, because I've been researching it for four years is distributed denial of service. And the declaring that even possessing tools that it enable you to participate in a DDoS action, or if you're a sysadmin, like DDoSing your own server to see that if it could handle that amount of traffic, um, makes you a terrorist. And what this is leading to is leading to a chilling effect and a huge amount of fuzziness in who is allowed to do what, and a, a fear, a genuine fear among activists that this is going to lead to people getting arrested in front of their computers for participating in a civil disobedience action or a nonviolent 
uh, protest involving a network that involves compromising some aspect of the network temporarily as part of a political action. So the arms, the arms race is very interesting in the, to me in that aspect of how it's being used against activists and civilians. I think there's a, a couple interesting things in the, the state of the law and the debate moving forward. Um, there's certainly lots of discussion, uh, but actually as going back to the last panel, one of the challenges over it is that we have um, seeming agreement, but when you pull the thread a little bit further, it's actually um, a violent disagreement. So for example, when we've brought together American, uh, American Western, Russian, and Chinese actors, they uh, will say, you know, uh, information attacks are a bad thing, and everybody um, kind of nods their head. But then we go, oh, well, what do you mean by information attacks? Well, the Americans talk about it as um, hitting critical infrastructure and causing damage of some sort, the power going out scenario, whereas um, the Chinese and Russian actors will define it as the spreading of information and false rumors that's threatening to societal stability. So it's um, Stuxnet versus Facebook. They both agree information, or ba information attacks are bad, but they're talking about very different things. Um, the second is the difference between talking and then taking actions that undermine it. So as an example, for a long period of time, the US said, ah, you know, a key, um, uh, air, uh, key stance for us in um, legal action when it, uh, when it comes to cyber is that no one should attack civilian infrastructure. Just like in the, um, with regular weapons, same kind of rules apply with that. And then we carried out Stuxnet which used civilian infrastructure to hit a civilian target. Now we then argue back and say, well, it was kind of different. One, it wasn't an act of war, it was an act of espionage, and that's Title 10 versus Title 50. And oh, by the way, the Iranians were up to really bad things. They were already in violation of international law by doing um, illegal nuclear research, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is it undercut the argument that the State Department had been making for years and years um, we have the same sort of thing when it came, you know, we were going to talk about the Talon Manual. Talon Manual, great, um, uh, you know, lots of legal experts brought together from around um, NATO to agree on it. And um, what did the United States government said? Really, really great, but we are not going to be bound by it in any way, shape, or form. Um, so talk and action, just like in other space, we're challenged by. Um, third is um, trying to figure out uh, what's the goal of the laws. Is the goal of the laws, when we're talking about here, to prevent bad ethical things playing out in war? So for example, the ICR, ICRC argument of, um, you know, we, we don't want civilians harmed. So for example, we should um, uh, have targets labeled in cyberspace just like they're labeled in the real world with red crosses on them, so to speak, digital versions, and you don't go after that. And then you get into a discussion just like we've gotten with physical of, ah, but people could manipulate that. So just as um, bad guys will move weapons around in ambulances, you might put a label, a, a, a red cross label on your Russian business network site. But that's different from understanding the goal of the law is, is it to prevent escalation, which is a, what much of arms control is about, um, prevent it, the war from going into something worse. So as an example to the um, IP theft, during the Cold War, the CIA and the KGB negotiated, not in writing, but a deal that was kind of unethical, but very effective, and the deal was CIA doesn't kill KGB, KGB doesn't kill CIA, but totally kosher to kill your allies. And the idea, so CIA could kill Vietnamese, um, KGB could kill Salvadoran agents, whatever, but the idea was to keep Russian and American spies from shooting each other because that could escalate into a real war where they would want. So we're, we don't like that we steal information from each other, but there are certain rules of the game that will follow. You could imagine that being negotiated when it comes to IP theft. Um, final uh, is this metaphor of, um, you know, traditionally we, we think about weapons and we want to regulate and ban weapons, but these parallels that I was talking about um, of public health and markets illustrates how this is very different. So um, 
the most effective thing that you can do against emergent cyber threats is share information about them. Share information about vulnerabilities so, so that those open windows are closed. So you may not want a arms control treaty, you may more want a CDC equivalent. Or another incredibly effective thing that you can do is to incentivize people, you can put bounties on the weapons. That is a marketplace that says, for everything that the Russian business network is paying you to make, um, to find vulnerabilities, we're gonna pay you more to find them so we can close them. A market-based model may be your best arms control regime, which you would never ever talk about that with you know, drones or tanks saying, okay, we're gonna pay people, we're gonna outbid the bad guys to build better tanks. Well, and the bounty system is already in place, like Facebook has a bug bounty and Google and these other companies because they discovered that it was easier to simply say, look, send us the bugs you find. We're going to incentivize you to help us rather than reversely incentivizing you to go out and sell them to the highest bidder outside of our system. But that's where you have the wonderful incentives between that's what they're incentivized to do and that's what, for example, Department of Homeland Security yeah. on the defense side should be incentivized to do. But then when you talk about an organization like NSA, which has both a offense and exploit role, but also defensive responsibility, it's got mixed motives there. So for example, when it knows of certain vulnerabilities, it may want to hold them so that it can continue to use them. So you have this question, um, and this played out in the Snowden disclosures, of um, certain actors will be incentivized to bake insecurity into the system. It's in their, their motive, and I don't blame them. It's, you know, if you are an intelligence <coughs> gathering agency, you would want to do that. But so then you have the, the notion of different government agencies competing with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's security by obscurity sort of run amok and awful. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's time to uh, open the floor to questions uh, from uh, the, uh, the audience. Uh, so we have our help with the microphones, uh, and I'll do my best to recognize people in the order in which I see hands. So George, I just saw you. This is on, yeah. Two quick ones for Peter and Molly. Um, Peter, it sounds like you've slightly changed your view from Stuxnet being an ethical weapon because it only targeted military hardware to uh, a bad example of an indiscriminate civilian weapon that makes um, its creators, whoever they may be, uh, seem to be hypocritical. And uh, Molly, on the, the geospatial metaphor, uh, Europe right now, the nations of Europe and uh, their cybersecurity forums are busy trying to reestablish its out boundaries, national boundaries, and um, and and re you know gain control of the internet infrastructure in their country, largely because of the Snowden affair. Uh, just wondered how wise you thought that policy was. So on the um, on Stuxnet. First, so I definitely uh, for those of others, um, George has written a great piece you know, arguing and it links, li links back um, really well to the last panel because um, we talked about autonomous weapons as a what if. Uh, I would argue Stuxnet software was actually the first autonomous weapon in history. That is, it was a weapon, um, it could cause physical harm, but it was autonomous. It was given a target and sent out in the world with no communication back. It was said, go cause bad things to this one target in the world. It met all the definitions that we would have of robotic hardware autonomy, just it wasn't a thing. Um, so then you get into the debate of, you know, um, is that ethical or not? Um, and was its impact or not. And you can make a very strong argument that it was a highly ethical weapon. It was clearly designed with the laws of war in mind. So um, it had everything from, you know, it could only cause harm to this one thing. So, uh, you know, even if you had a number of nuclear centrifuges in your basement that were made by the same manufacturers Iran was using, it still wouldn't cause harm to them. So it met all the definitions of being an ethical weapon. 
or at least legally designed weapon. That may be true, but that doesn't mean there's a difference between um, ethical and the impact of the operation itself. And that's what I was getting out of the seductive value, particularly even more so of, um, of, of unmanned, um, but more so arguably ethical weapons, is that we always think it's a slick and easy, but don't want to talk about the, the, rever the, the, the bounce back effects of it. So Stuxnet, huge success story, set back a rain nuclear weapon, didn't cause da damage to anything else in the world. You can, you can totally see why, you know, Mr. President, door number one is Iran gets nuclear weapons. Door number two is we carry out airstrikes on Iran and maybe we get a war. Or door number three is this weapon that's not going to kill anyone, um, no bad things, and no one's ever going to find out that we did it. You'd always choose number three. But it doesn't mean everything worked out as planned. So for example, the fact that we're talking about it is that it, it did go public. Yes, it didn't cause harm to any other target in the world, but it popped up in 25,000 plus computers in the world, including outside of Iran. Um, that's, it was found by Belarusian and German researchers legal question is, did it violate the laws of war by hitting the, whatever, the point being, um, it, it went loose, it was supposed to be covert, it went, it got disclosed, Rever bounce back effects, un as I mentioned, undercut um, State Department arguments against kinetic effect in cyber warfare. Maybe they were um, innocent or not, but the bottom line, it, it set that back. Um, it also, weirdly enough, um, it became an incredibly great time to be a cybersecurity researcher in Iran after Stuxnet. It incentivized Iran to plow massive amounts of money and organizational power into this, built up huge cyber weapons capability. Iran then did retaliatory attacks, for example, on Aramco to show that it could play in this game too. So the bottom line, we could still say ethical weapon, Strategic decision we would probably do, but just like everything else in war, doesn't mean it all worked out as you planned. So I'm actually going to go for both questions. Um, regarding Stuxnet, um, it may have qualified as an ethical weapon for some reads of specific, this type of specific cyber war ethics, but on the other hand, as was just pointed out, it wandered around in the civilian internet for a while. And it took up residence in some people in some civilian inter like some some, uh, some civilian computers for a while. Like, does that count as quartering soldiers in my house? <laughs> like, the concept that you can divide up a active zone of war fighting or an active zone of esp of cyber espionage from the civilian internet that has nothing to do with the current battle you're fighting is, as demonstrated by this one example, frankly a fantasy. And so the question of whether or not we want to proclaim that as, a, as an ethical weapon because we could hide the fact that we were you know, deploying weapons into civilian networks, um, I think is, is a question that we should actually take very seriously. Um, regarding the second question uh, about, P about countries hardening their sort of internet borders in response to the Snowden revelations, I think it's completely reasonable given the information that they have about what was going on and how their networks were compromised um, for them to want to engage in this type of border hardening. On the other hand, I find it incredibly depressing <laughs> because it's, it's, this is why we can't have nice things. This is why <laughs> we can't have a, a truly communitarian internet that is global and that, you know, is kind of fuzzy and like cute and fuzzy. We care about the global internet, but on the other hand, I really liked that idea. That was a really nice concept. And even if we can't practically have it, I rather feel like the countries of the world should be making that a goal of their, of their information policy, of their internet policy. And frankly, the fact that we can't have that because, because of what the NSA did, I find deeply depressing, but yes, a completely valid reaction. But it's not as if that's the first um, um, instigation to nations to close their internet yeah. borders. I mean, the Chinese have been building an internet oh, yeah. infrastructure from the beginning that was, uh, you know, based on totally different premises. From yeah, and there will always be countries who have specific sets of incentives in order to build, like, 
quarantined internets and national internets. But when you do that, what you have is you have a system that is far more prone to abuse by dictators who decide they want they don't want Egypt to be on the internet that day. Um, it makes it much easier for them to create restricted information bubbles where they can where the media is under far more government control than any other country. You're ba when you create a system in which countries are incentivized from the outside as well as from the inside to balkanize their internet and conceal it and hide it and cut it off from the rest of the world, that can only be bad for vulnerable citizens and vulnerable individuals within that country. So there's a challenge to international law in this area as well. So just as we've tried and perhaps failed to norm the space of cyber conflict through the talent exercise, so various UN-based agencies have tried to ask whether we can uh, write regulations, global regulations, for such structural facts about the internet. And we've failed at that uh, exercise as well. I'm told by people who are, understand what went on in the recent meeting in Brazil about this, that it was actually a set of American corporations, more than any other actors, who uh, undermined this uh, the, the, uh, the, these efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you think that's important? Should we be trying to attack this problem through these uh, global agencies like the uh, ITU and uh, so forth, uh, or not? Uh, Given that they are what we currently have, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not these agencies are actually, and other NGOs who are involved in internet governance are not so super awesome at implementing the multi-stakeholder dream of internet governance. Um, but they're what we have now, so let's run with it, but also let's keep in mind that how the current incarnation of international internet governance is not as unfraught as it likes to think it is sometimes. This is again where we need to kind of distinguish between how we traditionally think of weapons and war um, as you know, it's a, it's a state domain, and uh, and we want to limit it. And you know, as in the last panel, we get particularly um, concerned when non-state actors start to mess around in it, and they don't follow the same rules and all that sort of thing. Well, frankly, it's the exact opposite in this space. The danger is that it becomes a state domain. And so you talked about the idea that um, the UN couldn't succeed at this as a bad thing. No, that's a good thing if you actually like the internet and you like internet freedom. Um, and the risk is that, um, and remember, go back to the origin of the ITU um, goes to the telegraph and it had two goals. One was to um, make sure that the technology crossing state borders could work with each other. And second, to ensure that state governments could control it, including being able to read any and all messages crossing it. Go back to it, that's the origin. And the ITU is now looking at this and saying, and the state saying, well, the internet should be that way. No, I think the internet is, is worked because it's been this, um, you know, it, it, it's been the most powerful force for political, economic, and social change in our lifetimes, maybe all of human history, because it's not state dominated we're at risk of it. And the Snowden effect was the danger. Yes, the Chinas and the Russias were already going to be pushing for this. They were pushing for it. That was the last round of the IT. The impact of it is what it did to the coalition working against it, is the impact on the states like Germany and Brazil and India, where they're crossing, you know, they're starting to question, hold it, maybe more state control is a good thing, or, oh, by the way, the Americans who were saying they were all about internet freedom are completely undermining it. Um, that's the thing here. There, I wanted to toss out one more quick thing and thinking about how the difference of this weapon that goes to George's, the proliferation effect. Um, this is a weapon which can be highly ethical. You, you wrote that Stuxnet was ethical because it turned itself off. Mm -hmm. um, we would love, and that, uh, that's been argued about autonomous robots, that they could, you know, they, one way to keep them ethical is they, 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 there's a kill switch so, they, so they, they don't go wild. We did that with Stuxnet. But the difference with software is you're shooting the design out into the world. So the weapon can be turned off, but you've provided the blueprint to everyone else on how to build, if not that specific weapon, a weapon like it. Do we have other questions?
Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, on your point of uh, negotiating IP theft, and, and if you can elaborate on that, because conceptually, I have a difficult time understanding how that, that could potentially even come about. How, how do those negotiations play out? And if I can push the envelope a little bit with a, another quick question. Uh, the five indicted Chinese officials, they're never going to be arrested. They're never going to see the inside of a U.S. courtroom. What are the punishment options? Are they counterattacks or counter-exploitations that may have already have occurred? Is it uh, economic sanctions? Is it withdrawing uh, certain programs of, of cooperation with the Chinese? Thank you. So uh, I guess I'll take your second question first, and I'll, I'll leave Peter to answer. It. I believe the first question was directed at Peter. Is that yes. Okay. So um, with respect to, you're absolutely right. First of all, those indictments were, some would say, theater. Uh, but I still argue a necessary first step. It's at least something, right? We've at least recognized the fact uh, our government has made some attribution now, finally. Which you know, before this, we had uh, the Mandiant report, and we had CrowdStrike, and we had writing about it, but our government remained interestingly silent. So for the first time now, uh, albeit a rather ineffectual step, at least they've, they've, they've made some attribution. Uh, with respect to what can we do now, what is the next step? I would offer in this case, um, looking across the spectrum of, of, of power uh, resident within our government, you know, diplomatic, information, military, economic, it's clearly economic. Uh, these attacks, uh, there I did it myself, uh, these exploits um, were economically driven. This is about China competing at, uh, on a global scale, and, and the competition in their mind is economic. They don't distinguish necessarily. This is economic. So you, you have to respond in this case. Uh, if you are to disincentivize, you've got to respond economically. <coughs> what do I mean by that? You go after the business interests of the political leaders that are behind the, the uh, Chinese PLA activities. Um, that is the only way. You, you could throw a million in jail, there will be a million more. You could uh, you know, create all sorts of, uh, of sanctions or political uh, regimes that constrain the government at large, but really this is about the pocketbooks of those um, big business interests of the political leaders. That is the only way that you could begin to impose some sort of cost, because this is about imposing a degree of credible cost. Um, but I, beyond that, uh, I, I, like many, are, are at a loss, because this is a tough challenge. So three things. The, the first is to pull back on this complete agreement that um, we don't talk, think enough about the IP side versus these other narratives. We are living right now, we are the victim of the largest theft in all of human history by the economic value. The largest in all of human history. The types of things that have been stolen range everything from um, multi, uh, actually, um, the value of the program that the, uh, that the Air Force has been on is one point, will be $1.4 trillion, the Joint Strike Fighter. We are already seeing its design elements woven into Chinese jet fighters, to soft drink companies, to furniture companies, to um, think tanks and academic institutions. All, all have been targeted and had information taken from them. Um, it's not just economic security value when you're talking about things as well, like jet fighters. It's not, I, I, that's where we probably differ, is that it's, it's, it's part of its economic, but it will play out on future battlefields too. Um, it won't just cost money, it'll cost lives. Um, second, um, your first and, and second question actually link because the indictments were part of a negotiation, not a negotiation that we like to think of it as the two sides presenting papers to each other and amending language. Basically, the negotiation that was going on was originally the U.S. government was meeting with China and saying, you need to stop this, you need to rein this in, and if you don't, we're going to take it public. We didn't get the response we wanted, and those indictments were part of the taking it public. <coughs> the, um, they set the table for another series of actions that could be 
potentially be taken. For example, it gives um, the companies that were victims of it, those named companies, potential legal recourse that they didn't have before because now they've got this evidence to point to from the U.S. government, not just from a, a Mandian or a private company report. It also allows us potentially to take it to domains that China may care about more than a Pennsylvania courtroom that none of these hackers are ever going to see, where, for example, you might take it to the WTO or something like that. The problem, though, is where law meets the real world, so far the actual effect of those indictments has been nothing to stop China, but billions of dollars lost to American companies in retaliation, such as Microsoft, et cetera, being um, Apple, um, you know, losing uh, access to certain markets. Um, so the American companies are not happy, the victims, the irony is the victims of these are not happy about the, the legal action taken. Um, this leads to, you said, you know, but what can we do in the future? I, you know, when I talk about, this is tacit negotiations, maybe not written into law, but things like, for example, look, I'm not happy if you're going to try and steal my jet fighter secrets, but I understand that that's part of the nature of the game. But when you start fiddling around in Ohio power companies, I have to question, is this actually, I can get confused as to this is, whether this is exploit theft, or maybe you're setting the stage for an attack. Or when you get into my nuclear command and control facilities, that's different than the usual espionage game. I, there's bad things that can happen accidentally or intentionally. So that's the kind of tacit negotiations we may have to do. But we have to recognize that there's a baked in irony of what the US is trying to argue here. We're basically telling China, we're okay with you doing things that harm, we're okay with national security threat theft, but we really don't like it when you do economic security theft. If, if, I, if I could just tag on, I, I want to kind of elaborate on one point, and that is that I agree there, there's a distinction between uh, you know, clear defense contractors, the military industrial complex that is being targeted, and it is. Uh, I would offer that that's closer to the end of the spectrum of traditional espionage roles, right? I mean, that, that's almost fair. Uh, yeah. The issue that I have is the more insidious theft of true intellectual property or that innovation that has yet to bear fruit, right? A, a savvy, asymmetric thinking adversary is going to go after that intellectual property, that, that capital, that is in its incubation stage so that they can take it and beat us to market with it by, by basically taking all of the hard work already done and then they can leapfrog to, to rushing, right? So it's one of those you can't prove the negative. I can't tell you, I can quantify the, 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 some of the intellectual property theft in the form of, you know, the, the defense industry, the fighters or whatever. What I can't tell you is how many Zuckerbergs have not made it to Zuckerberg status because their idea was stolen five years ago and rushed to market before theirs, right? Or, and it never allowed them to see to fruition. That's the difficult part of this. I mean, that's, I would argue, what makes America so great is that innovation and the, the, that is the, the engine of the economy. We progressed from a, um, you know, to a service-based, economy from an industrial one, and now you, you know, we've moved on even beyond that. But that's very tenuous, and the internet space, the cyberspace domain, allows that theft at levels never before seen, and I would argue diminishes that part of our economy, which is the thing that really drives it. And so uh, how you measure that, how you quantify it, how you conduct retribution, how you conduct deterrence in that arena is what's so incredibly difficult and one that, that we're struggling with. I would actually, to jump in here, I would just throw in my opinion that I don't actually believe that the U.S. defense sector has any part in preventing IP, IP theft, theft purely, the type that has a negative impact on our, our corporations and doesn't have a defense sector impact. Um, it is that type of base assumption that leads to activists who are involved in distributed denial of service actions being held personally responsible for over $200,000 worth of damages to the Koch Brothers Corporation because they participated in a 15-minute DDoS that led to the website being down for five minutes. 
But, but to my point, it, how do you negotiate tacitly or actively the economic IP theft? Because it's not just the primes that are having the IP stolen. It's, you mentioned a bottling company, or, or it, it, it's all that innovation. You have, well, a couple and, you have, and, and because it's residing with private or public companies and not necessarily the U.S. government, I'm having trouble understanding how we can, as a nation, negotiate that, what's off limits. Everything ought to be off limits because it's our economic security that's at risk. So it's, it's, it's basically thinking about this as um, you know, cost-benefit analysis. So right now, you have an entity that faces no costs and has the potential of incredible value um, in what's taking. So it's, um, and in the way it was described to me, um, a metaphor was if you leave a sack of cash on a park bench, why are you blaming me for picking up the sack of cash? Um, so you have to change this. You have to exact some costs and one cost that was tried was the indictment. That was the embarrassment cost. That's not effective in my mind. Instead, when I mentioned the WTO, that you take it to that area because that is a domain that has been critical to China's economic rise and will get their attention. Um, another example is you have to involve players that matter. So traditional arms control talks, what do we do? We bring together the foreign ministries of the two states to negotiate. Well, I can tell you there are two entities in government that, th there's no two entities in, in the American and Chinese government that are less influential on cybersecurity issues than the State Department and the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Neither side's own players listen to them, let alone do they have the expertise on it. The Chinese um, military doesn't work at the beck and call of the Foreign Ministry. And of course, NSA was doing things that State Department didn't know about and certainly could not influence. So bring together the right people. Another part of this is, as I mentioned, coalitions. Um, it'd be a lot more effective if we were dealing with this not in a bilateral, but a multilateral, where it's not just the US saying, gosh darn it, China, why are you doing this? But every victim that's out there, that's where the impact of Snowden undercut us, um, where we lost a lot of the other nations that might have come along. That's changing. Um, Canada just for the first time went public saying China attacked us. So you're trying to exact costs. The flip side is um, make the attacks harder to carry out. That's the, get better at defense. Stop leaving the bag of cash on the, on the bench. And that though hits this issue that we were chatting before about of, well, whose responsibility is it? I would argue it's not the US military's, it's those private actors that need to build in you know, more resilience into their own systems. But right now, because we frame everything as cyber 9-11, that leads to the assumption that it must be um, the state responsibility. Um, and it's also good for defense budgets to say, give me more money and I'll be the one that will come in and protect you. <coughs> Instead, it, you know, if a bank is robbed, we don't call in the US military. But in cyber, we, to, you know, anonymous, I, in congressional testimony, we've used examples of anonymous DDoS attacks on banks as why we need to fund U.S. military cyber capability. It's an erroneous argument. But you know, in the failed attempts so far to incentivize American corporations, just to talk about it here in North America, uh, through legislation in, in, in Congress, um, and then through some of the new regulations that Obama administratively uh, put in place, most of the pushback has come from American corporations. It hasn't been a self-interested U.S. military trying to grow its own budget that was opposing that. Uh, it was uh, it was major U.S. corporations. No, it's corporations so who corporation? don't have an interest in spending money hardening their own systems, and until they get hit. Well, and, right. no, and then they're still not interested in hardening their systems against attack because they're mostly incentivized to not disclose and not tell people that they have been attacked. And the only reason we hear about most data breaches is because a lot of these corporations are headquartered in California, which has a law that says if you have a data breach, you actually have to tell people. You can't just sit on your hands and pretend everything's okay. And those corporations are in turn enabled by a 
hyper-vigilant private defense sector that is primarily interested in conflating corporate interests with defense interests because then their market, their consumer pool expands greatly. So like there are incentives in place preventing corporations in the United States from spending money to harden their own systems and they're enabled by those private corporations that work primarily with the US defense sector and this is about conflating the, issue, the interests of US based capitalistic corporations with US defense interests. So how do you change this? Mostly I yell at people. <laughs> I'm gonna take the, the not so, uh, that, that ecosystem like the internet itself is evolving so, for example, yes, the last time around, um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the business sector uh, effectively fought um, regulation in this space. But we're seeing certain changes, so, and it goes back to costs. Um, corporate boards have gone from thinking about this as a tax on them, not just a tax, but a tax. Oh, you're going to force me to spend on my own cybersecurity and it's not going to be to my benefit to, you know, frankly, um, Target mattered in the, more in the last year than Edward Snowden to the American business community. And the reason is Target lost, um, I'll don't, hold on, I hate that we're being webcast because I might misremember the number, but I believe we're up to $1.4 billion in cost to Target. And people, as opposed to some of the past corporate attacks, people lost their jobs. Um, the board that was threatened with recall. And every other corporate board in the non-tech sector looked at that and went, whoa, cyber is something we have to think about. You also have the rise, capitalistic can actually work for you on security. In the previous round, you didn't have a cybersecurity industry that right now measures $70 billion in revenue, and over the next three years will be $140 billion in revenue. And they've got incentives for these regulations because they'll make money for it, so they're pushing for it. And the final thing, the chamber is kind of conflicted on it. Originally, it fought really hard against regulation. Now its membership is in lots of different places. And oh, by the way, the chamber got hacked by China. So at the same time, they were right after they were fighting it, their thermostats and printers were hooking up onto servers in China. So they've got a slightly different perspective. So it may not, you know, this is we're not always going to be in this space of saying. Um, no, cybersecurity is not good, we shouldn't invest in it. A big part of it turns on all of us. Will we as customers start to, will we start to reward companies that have good cybersecurity and punish ones that don't? And that's what Target kind of faced, but what about the other players? Yeah. In fact, the, the biggest issue is, is the banking infrastructure, because what, what is the brand of a bank? What, what are they selling? They're selling security. Put your money here because it is safe. I would argue that the reason they have not disclosed uh, and continue to resist disclosure of the billions of dollars lost annually uh, is at best a person would look at that and move their money elsewhere. If I think Bank A is insecure because I've read a report that they have had X billions of dollars taken out, I'm going to move my money at best. At worst, you would see a global run on the banks. People would go back to mattresses when they really truly understood how vulnerable because my money isn't real, it's just ones and zeros. And, it could just disappear like that, right? So that's the, the obviously the far end of the spectrum. But I think that there's a clear disincentive to disclose and discuss, particularly in the financial industry. Uh, but that extends to, to, to all of the, the private sector. And really, my only point at the beginning of this was certainly not that the Department of Defense wants or expects or uh, desires to be in this business. It's that expectation gap that I was talking about what element of the government, if any, at some point, is going to be expected to do something about it, right? Just as we had banks that were too big to fail, and the government did roll in. What section of our industry is too big to not be defended, or too big to, to not be protected at some point? Uh, open question. And but, frankly, the expectation that the US government and the defense sector in particular should be expected to provide these types of defensive services to US corporations is something that's enabled directly by the US hegemonic policy towards internet governance. Like the US has had a manifestly 
dominant stance on how the internet should be governed until very recently, until the Snowden affairs when everyone was like, whoa, maybe we're not okay with like the root being in the US. Maybe we're not okay with the you know, Assigned Names and Numbers Corporation being so closely tied to US government organizations. But there is a distinct benefit to the US Defense Department to maintain this perspective of US hegemony and, and that is what is encouraging corporations to say, well, I'm just gonna wash my hands because this is basically US territory anyway, so why doesn't the US military defend me? But there, this, this banking example to take us from a internet governance question to back to you know, weapons and war question, the banking one's a great illustration of the difference between what is legal, what is ethical, and what is strategic. Um, so, uh, prior to, um, during the, the Kosovo War, um, and again in Libya and in Iraq, and we also internally talked about it recently related to um, Russia, it was floated inside the U.S. government, hey, one of the, instead of doing airstrikes right at the start, why don't we empty the bank accounts of the cronies of these very clear bad guys? Milosevic, Putin's buddy, Saddam Hussein. The money, they, it's their money and their cronies and it's, they, it's money that they've stolen, um, that they've gotten through rape, murder, pillage. We can all agree that they're both bad and this is money they ought not to have. And it, wouldn't it even be better that we would not kill anyone, a way of influencing them to you know, stop doing the bad thing, maybe prevent the war would be to go after their bank account. This was floated inside the U.S. government. This sounds really great. I see, you know, our ethicists over there going, "This sounds great." Um, and oh, by the way, we have the capability to do it. Now you get into the legal question. Well, weirdly enough, we can argue that legally about shooting tomahawk missiles or drone strikes or whatever at them, but the legality of emptying people's bank accounts is actually jags pop up and international lawyers go, whoa, whoa, that means you're crossing international lines, you're implicating civilian side, you're doing all of these things that you're not allowed to do in war. And then strategic, the real decision, because you can fudge the law sometimes, the real decision of why we didn't do it turned on well, we may gain a lot from this and stop some kind of horrible thing where lots of people are going to be killed. But if the U.S. shows that it can empty people's bank accounts, that threatens the entire international banking system and everybody's going to pull their money out of banks, most especially out of American banks. And so this is what I'm getting is like these things all connect, but there's also, you know, um, uh, you know, Internet governance relates to finance, relates to the battlefield. But we also need to understand the difference between what's legal, what's ethical, what's operational and strategic. They don't always align perfectly the way we assume they do. There's a question back here. So given that this is a metaphor and metaphors have their limits and can constrain conversation, there are connections between cyber warfare and say biological warfare um, if you look at Stuxnet as some kind of a virus, you release a virus out into the world, you may have a particular population or a particular target, but once it's out there, um, given the interconnectedness of society and stuff like that, you oftentimes can't uh, prevent it from doing harm or at least taking up residence in people's systems. Um, I'm curious as to what the three of you see in terms of if we look at that analogy, are there things that we can learn? Are there things that we can't learn? Um, and maybe Mooch, if I can call you that. Um, if you can comment on uh, the US military has red teamed strategic um, issues surrounding biological warfare in the past. Uh, can, do, have we learned anything? Um, as it relates to cyber uh, from those exercises? Um, or is that kind of not something that we can talk about? Sorry. Yeah, so um, probably that. <laughs> no. So let, let, me, let me say it this way. Clearly, the, the US government's position, uh, very public position, is that we take a 
full of government approach, full spectrum cyber operations, right? And so we reserve the right to um, the right of self-defense and the right of response to include full spectrum. And what does full spectrum mean, right? Every, in terms of in cyberspace, it's it's everything from basic benign defense blocking on one end all the way to whatever you can conceive of. Uh, with respect to the parallels between um, biological warfare, uh, clearly I don't think, while there are similarities in some of the, um, the ways of thinking about it, it's, it's not biological warfare. I mean, we call it a virus, um, but it does not have the same sort of effect. Uh, I would even argue that it, today, with today's technology, um, the idea of a virus getting out there, a, a legitimate biological virus getting out there and then morphing and propagating and turning into other things, all, all those, for all those reasons, we have explicitly said we are not operating in that domain. Um, I can say that t with today's technology, we, in the cyberspace domain, we, we don't have those concerns of, of something, quote, getting into the wild uh, and, and turning into something that we cannot control. In the future, perhaps, that may be the case. I, I, I just, uh, I do not think that that is a, a, an immediate concern. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So that's sort of, you've actually just brought up a second metaphor, which is the internet or your computer as body metaphor, um, which also makes people super anxious uh, because you end up talking about damage to bodies and viruses and people think about getting a cold. But one thing I also want to make clear is there's a difference between the World Wide Web which is what you see when you open up your web browser, and the internet, which is the layers of infrastructure and things that enable it to function, and to, many ex and to some extent includes also like sort of the human organizations that support the infrastructure and make it function. Um, so the question of whether or not a sort of a bioweapon or CDC model that we were talking about earlier would be a more effective metaphor is it's certainly a more it's certainly a more different metaphor. It, it enables different ways of thinking. It enables different paths of response that aren't enabled by a purely aggressive risk board model of the internet. And so I would I'm not I certainly don't hate metaphors. I love metaphors, but I love lots of metaphors and lots of metaphors being present at the same time. And basically your question made me think of this one episode of Star Trek where there's a bioweapon walking around with a virus tailored to a specific alien, and that episode didn't end up well for anybody. <laughs> Star Trek rejoinder. So we've been um, dancing a little so I've been dancing a little bit around this one issue of um, how do we go forward, but I asked this question um, partly for my own interest and partly in honor of a late faculty member, Henry King, who partly started the program here, um, and he was known for asking this question quite a lot. Is this a 21st century problem that we're stuck solving with the 20th century laws and mindset and model, and if we are, where do we go now? Because, and I know you've been dancing sort of mentioned a little bit here and there, but clearly it's, it, it, it's um, we have, we seem to have this, this um, problem of mindset throughout, the attack or exploit problem, the metaphor problem, the, the recognition that it's an issue, but we don't know what to do with it. So where, where do we go now? So I'll, I'll attempt this one. Um. <laughs> I would offer that there actually is utility to go back to the 19th and 18th century models <coughs> to solve what is now a 21st century problem. And I would commend to you a book by Joseph Whelan called Jefferson's War. Um, and I think I reference it in the, the paper that I, I wrote for this uh, for the, for the journal. Um, and, and Whelan makes the, the point that uh, the, the piracy uh, that begat the Barbary Wars at uh, the hands of the Pasha's in the days of, uh, of the Mediterranean is actually what created uh, a, a fledgling U.S. military. And it was, in fact, the response to uh, the economic challenges of the piracy that was going on uh, that Whelan argues is the first, America's first war on terror. I would offer that it, in fact, is the closest parallel 
to the problem that we have today in cyberspace um, of that theft of intellectual property, the piracy that is happening. Um, uh, and we, they, we've been talking about you know, what is the role of the Department of Defense, the, of the government, um, and I would offer that there is um, some very valuable lessons to be had in terms of understanding uh, with a nod to Hugo Grotius, who really is the father of law, was focused on the law of the sea, right? It was this global commons, the idea of how do you govern in an ungoverned space, how do you um, create norms and precedent and strength and weakness in this space that is not a nation state. And so uh, perhaps an overflogged analogy, but I would offer that there is great utility uh, in looking at uh, the roles uh, of the military and the government, and I'm not advocating by any means uh, one way or the other, but I think there's utility in understanding uh, how we dealt with piracy, how we dealt with the law of the sea in that time when our economy was in fact so critical uh, at a time of kind of the new nation's uh, growth. Obviously, I'm not going to say that we shouldn't use every single information set at our disposal to sort of figure out how to deal with this zone of human interest. But I would also refer you to Larry Lessig's Law of the Horse and say, while this may be a space that is same in theme to every other space of human endeavor, it is different in kind. Like we had, there are different challenges. The governance is completely different. Like, for example, in the U in the general U.S.-based internet and World Wide Web, there are no public spaces. It's entirely controlled by corporations and corporate entities. And someone always owns wherever you're standing on the internet. Someone with a big corporation, usually headquartered in California. <laughs> We have never actually had to deal with that, <coughs> that entirely corporately owned space in terms of like free speech rights, uh, in terms of public gatherings, in terms of disruption, in terms of what people's political rights are. And we can't, like, as cool as pirates are, we can't simply go back and say, well, this is how we dealt with this then. Because we've essentially created an entire zone of human endeavor for Americans who have certain rights where those rights do not apply because they've either been contracted out or they don't simply, they don't exist on private property. So the question of is this a 21st century problem that we're attempting to deal with with 20th century solutions, I would actually say similarly but differently, uh, it's a 21st century problem we're attempting to deal with with 19th and 18th century solutions. Um, the biggest law that's used in anti-hacking pr uh, prosecutions is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is a fraud-based law. So if you run around and defraud 200 little old ladies with your hat and you're in the real world, you are a very, you, you are serious about committing fraud. You are probably a bad person. But if you are involved in a DDoS action and the corporation that was the target of your DDoS action says, well, there were 100,000 people who tried to access our website when it was down, that could be 20 minutes. Like you could have been running low orbit ion can for 20 minutes and they could still claim that there are you know, X number of people who are victims of that. And congratulations, you're now liable for lots and lots of money in fines, lots and lots of time in jail, and as a bonus, whatever that corporation decides their personal damages are. So the laws and tactics we are using <coughs> to regulate this space are not adapted to the space as it exists, and it's re resulting in massive, what I would call human rights violations on like a very large scale in terms of trying to deal with it, and it's, 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 not, it's not functioning. So, while we should be using all information that is available to us to build future strategies, we simply need to be aware that the scale at which we're dealing with this and the scale at which human beings are being presented to us as victims or perpetrators or whatever is beyond the scope of anything we've had to deal with in the past. Three quick things. The first is, um, I agree there's a maritime <laughs> model to learn from here. But um, as we argue in the book, um, yes, there's a, there's a pirates one, but the, the real problem, it's actually pirates and privateering. The real problem is not actors that everyone universally agrees are bad criminal actors. Pirates, it's the fuzzy space in the middle 
that used to be common called privateers. And actually, you know, that same period of, yes, um, we sent the U.S. Navy to the Barbary Coast, but a, few, a couple years later, the War of 1812, um, you had 23 U.S. Navy ships. And, you know, my Navy friends don't like to hear about it because they think they won the War of 1812, but um, actually over a thousand privateers. And it was the privateers that brought the British economy, harmed it so much. And it's this, I'm a state actor, I'm quasi-state sponsored, but I'm also kind of criminal, I'm in the middle. And the privateering ones, they really, um, and that's the parallel of the Russian business network. So the hit on JP Morgan a couple days ago, was it someone trying to steal from them? Or was it a licensed hit by Russia signaling, hey, you financially sanction us, we can do things within your banks if you don't watch out. Or the Mandian um, and the other China reports, yes, they're PLA, but are they PLA working on behalf of the PLA or contracted out to steal IP for PLA associated companies? Bottom line, it's this fuzzy space in the middle. It's also a better parallel because back in the day, mentioning the US, we were the worst at it. We were the bad guys with privateers. And over time, to back to the question over there, we actually created a norm where whether it was a pirate or a privateer, you were responsible for it if it was coming from your home territory. We created accountability in the system. Um, we also created a professionalization model where the <coughs> formal Navy squeezed out the quasi stuff. That's how we go about the, the riskiest points in the space. Real quickly, the other two, um, is it a, a, a 21st century problem with a um, 20th century law, you know, to throw out two others. I actually think that the two um, years that's the problem here is 1648. So we're coming at it with laws built around assumptions of sovereignty and state states is the only primary power, state firm borders, et cetera. That clearly doesn't apply here, but that's how the system is structured. And secondly, it's a, um, you know, depending on when you want to count the start of the internet, it's a 1969 model. Baked into this is not a legal question, it's an origin question. Um, yes, it was funded by DARPA, but it was a bunch of late 1960s, early 1970s computer scientists based in Northern California hippies who created an entirely open structure and model that's awesome and works and is all about sharing. Oh, why was the internet created? It wasn't created to have a secret communications network for nuclear attack. It was created to share a scarce resource, computer time. So it's all about sharing, and yet now it's owned. Now there's threats in it. Uh, you know, so that's the problem, is, is the way it's been baked. Um, and there's an assumption, though, that we all need to get rid of, is that it's a problem that can somehow be solved. It's a problem that can, can go away. As long as you're using the internet, there will be internet threats. They'll, you know, we have to stop thinking about this as something that you can deter or scare or regulate and start to think of it instead as just a natural part of the ecosystem, the marketplace, whatever metaphor it is. There's always gonna be bad things and bad guys on it. We have to instead focus on resilience models. We are almost out of time. Uh, let me invite our panelists. Uh, if you have one last pearl of wisdom you'd like to leave the audience with uh, briefly. And, um, OK, so this is probably unfair to pull the pin on this discussion grenade without any chance. Uh, but, but I did want to leave you with one thing that did, we didn't get a chance to discuss during this. And it, I picked up on it in the first panel, and I see it here as well. And that is the, the discussion of lethal versus non-lethal weapons. And I would merely offer that to advance the discussion here, we shift from a discussion of weapons to one of effects. Uh, and I would use this example to ask you to think about it uh, as you think about the focus, whether or not it be on weapons or effects. So if an F-16 drops a 1,000 pound bomb on a fiber cable in the middle of a desert or a building that houses a router or a switch, is that a cyber or a kinetic attack or a cyber attack, or is it a physical attack? Uh, conversely, if a truly cyberspace weapon, ones and zeros, sent through internet space, through an, into an industrial control system that opens the doors, floodgates of a dam and, and, and kills a thousand people, or uh, generates a timing reference problem 
between a refueling airplane and another airplane, causing them to miss their refueling and an airplane crashes into the ground. Is that a kinetic attack or a cyberspace attack? The, the point is, we ought not focus on the weapon, but on the effect of the weapon. And it would help, because right now, we, I think we focus too much uh, on the former, not the latter. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Um, effects, not weapons, uh, to advance the debate. And I thank you very much, and, and in case Western and the team, for, for allowing me the opportunity. Um, I guess just to sum up, I would reiterate um, that the current dominant metaphor, the geospatial metaphor, uh, is, while effective and compelling, um, has severe negative implications for human rights, internet governance and control, and the technological development of the internet and other network systems in general, and should be deeply re-examined uh, from, uh, from sort of the ground up as to how much we actually want to be building our infrastructure off of that metaphor. And also, thank you for having me. This was super fun. <laughs> Peter? There's a, um, the way we talk about this, this problem is there's issues that loom that might happen one day or as an example, the, the ignorance problem that I mentioned, it's, well, yeah, senior leadership today doesn't get it, but don't worry, the next generation that grew up with this technology will get it right. Um, we have this idea that these issues can be dealt with over time, can be negotiated, debated, et cetera, but the danger here is that we're making decisions now that are truly being baked into the law, the, the, the setting precedents that will be followed, um, technical structures, governance questions that were not, go not going to be easily changed. And another way of putting this is that um, this feels like something that we have time to wrestle with, and yet most of these things are either already happening or happening right now. And you know, as you put it, the, the fear that I have, um, you know, as you put it, is we, we, we're, we, we're not allowed to play with great things. Um, this domain is both a battle space, but as I said before, it's the most powerful tool for economic, political, and social change. And yet, when I think about the internet that my kids are gonna inherit, it's not gonna be as cool as the one that we had. And that's because of all the things we're deciding and doing right now. And that, that's kind of my big worry as opposed to, you know, Cyber 9-11 and the like, is that it's more about what is this whole thing gonna look like? And so, um, again, wanna add my thanks in for um, the organizers of allowing us to have this discussion that crossed so many different boundaries. Well, on that depressing note, the <laughs> internet won't be cool. Anymore. I guess we should really wrap this up. Uh, join me in thanking Very quickly for participants, lunch is across the hall.